Okay, could everyone hear me? Okay, tonight I'm gonna to talk about building your first HF station. And, you know, this is based, a lot of my, the slides are based on my own opinion. It doesn't mean it's gospel or the only way to do it. Page. May need to stay, hit, start the slideshow, Ed. I think you're still in in edit mode. <laughs> okay. Go so, go over to go over to slideshow and just hit start. Nope, okay, not slide. Okay. Slideshow. One more to the right. This is. No. I, I okay. What's happening is slideshow. Okay. Should I start it over? Um. Yeah, slides. Start, start from first slide. Just try okay. that. There you go. Now you're good. Yeah, okay. So all stations require an HF high frequency transceiver, a power supply, antenna, and a proper station ground. And I'm going to elaborate on each of these topics. First, we'll talk about transceivers. Oh, page up. Okay, the cost varies from maybe two hundred dollars. Uh, not seeing anything yet. Uh, okay. We are seeing it, uh, Steve. I'm not sure. You may need to restart. Cost varies from it. two hundred dollars for a used transceiver to well over five thousand dollars for the new transceivers, latest and greatest. The typical transceiver runs 100 watts output and covers 160 through 10 meters. The next slide is me just showing off my age. In the olden days, before transceivers, we would typically operate with a separate transmitter, a separate receiver. And in today's dollars, they cost far more than a modern transceiver cost. The major brands of transceivers include ICOM, Yaesu, Kenwood, Elecraft, and Flex. And which is better is sort of like Chevy, Ford, Toyota, Honda, it's personal preference. And examples of transceivers are a Yaesu FT450D, a used price is approximately $500. And possibly the most popular transceiver ever made, the ICOM 7300, which is an amazing rig, could be bought new for roughly $1,100. And I've seen it on sale even cheaper. And that transceiver is so amazing for the money that it's causing the prices of used equipment to plummet. Feel free to just break in with any questions. So there's a picture of the Yesu FT450D. John Porter owns that and he's brought it to field day. John, you'll have to cut it in half for each of our field day sites. Yeah, no, well, I, I, well we'll let, we'll let uh, Jim talk about it later. He doesn't want me to bring it again. <laughs> okay. This is the ICOM 7300. I can think of at least 10 club members that have the 7300. It's just an amazing rig for the money. Okay, now power supply. What's the purpose of a power supply is to convert 110 volt AC wall voltage to 13.8 volts DC, which is required for most of today's transceivers. And typically you need approximately 25 amps. There's two basic types of power supplies. What's known as a linear, that's a classic design. They have big transformers are heavy and they're easy to repair. Then we have the more modern switching power supplies are lighter, less expensive to repair, less expensive, harder to repair, their downfall is unless they have proper internal filtering, they radiate noise that could get into your receiver. A typical new linear power supply 
that would handle 25 amps list price is approximately $250, while the equivalent switching power supply is $130. Now, brands of power supplies are Astron, Sanlix, Alinco, MFJ, and others. And these companies make a traditional bulk linear power supply or switching. My own preference is an Astron linear power supply. They're often available used for, oh, under $75, even on the club swap fast. Now, many people place their power supplies on the floor. And I know from experience, never place it directly on carpet because it'll cut off air circulation. So if you do place it on your floor and you have carpet, I recommend a scrap piece of plywood underneath it to ensure air circulation. So the takeaway from this slide is any power supply will work, but my own preference or recommendation for New Ham is a Astron power supply and just buy one used. I have one Astron power supply that I've used. Oh, I probably use it between eight and 12 hours a day and I've had it since 1970, never had it fail. And if it failed, it'd be pretty easy to repair. So that's a picture of a typical Astron traditional linear power supply. This one has two meters, one voltage, one current. And that's a Samlex switching power supply. It probably doesn't even weigh six pounds. And this, the previous, that probably weighs about 25 pounds. Okay, next, the most important part of your station is your antenna. So basically there's different, I'm gonna go over what I consider the basic antenna type. So wire antenna and a rule of thumb is should be as high as possible. Ends in the center are often supported by ropes attached to trees. You wanna support the center to avoid sag. And the examples include an off-center fed dipole or a fan dipole or a G5RZ. And these cost approximately $100 with coax, whether you build it or you could buy one pre-assembled. Then a vertical antenna is very popular. However, a vertical antenna ground mounted, which is great for DX because it has a low angle of radiation requires many radials, dozens, if not a hundred or so. And they cost new approximately $350. Now, if you mounted your vertical up on your garage roof or house roof, then an elevated vertical works fine with just a few radials, as little as two radials per band. Another option is, a, oh, a 60 foot tower with a Yagi antenna that has gain. Typically installed, they cost several thousand dollars. So here's the, my own recommendation for a new HF operator, an off-center fed dipole covers many bands. They don't work well on 15 though. And you could build or buy one for about a hundred dollars. And I'd say many, many members of our club have used off-center dipole off-center fed dipoles. Off-center fed dipole just means it's approximately 135 feet. And it's, instead of being fed at the center, it's fed off-center. So one side might be 60 feet and the other side might be 75 feet. Now, other station considerations. Where do you wanna locate your station? In your basement or on a second floor or an attic? Well, here's my opinion on it. All stations require sound bonding and grounding. It's very hard to have a short connection from your station to an outside ground rod if the station is in the upper floor. So my recommendation is if possible, use your basement. If you have a corner in a finished or unfinished basement and you wanna tie your equipment grounds power panel grounds and station ground rods together. 
and grounding's a whole subject that others have covered in great detail here. Now, here's how I do my internal station grounding and I show a picture in the next slide. I have a 48 inch, half inch diameter copper pipe mounted at the back of my operating table with some straps. I connect the center of it with number six wire to my outside ground rod. And then I jumper, I use braid to connect each piece of my equipment ground terminal to this ground bus bar. And I use radiator hose clamps for the most part. Then outside my station, I have an eight foot ground rod pounded in the ground. I have a prox, I, I prefer to keep it approximately 18 inches from any concrete because concrete acts as a sponge and could wick the moisture away from your, uh, the soil surrounding your ground rod. And that's kind of the best commercial practice that is used in the radar industry. A ground rod should be, you know, 18 inches or so away from any concrete. So this is not a great picture, but that's the back of my operating table. You could see the copper pipe. And in the center of it, you probably can't see it. I have a number six wire that goes outside. It's no more than 10 feet and it connects to my ground rod. And then all my equipment is connected to this ground rod. Now outside my ground rod is connected to my tower ground rod and it's also connected to the ground rod at my Dominion power panel. Again, you wanna tie all your grounds together for safety reasons. Now additional accessories include watt meters, SWR meters, antenna tuners, that have extended tuning ranges from those built into modern transceivers, antenna switches, et cetera. But please note that most of the modern transceivers have a built-in SWR and watt meter. So you don't wanna to have too many accessories because every accessory introduces a few tenths of a dB of insertion loss and that adds up. Other considerations, logging software. Gone are the days of paper and pencil logs. There are many programs available for free or at low cost for logging. When I moved here eight years ago, it became apparent that N3 FJP software almost seemed to be the unofficial AARC logging program. And Jim Owen taught me how to use it in about five minutes at field day. And every time I visit Larry Iker, he was using it. So I, I've been using it the past several years and I'm very happy with it. Just personal preference. It costs about $60, but you could try out any logging program. You could start out with some of the freeware. And if you don't like it, you could export the data into a standard file format and then import it into any logging program. I've done that two or three times. Then there's Ham Radio Deluxe, which is cost about $100. It's a very powerful logging program. It has a steep learning curve and it's gotten very complicated. I personally don't like it and I used to use it all the time. And log, that's free. I use that for a number of years. Several members of the club use DX Lab. That's a very powerful suite of logging programs. Most logging programs are Windows-based, but there are some for Apple and Linux. Now, all logging programs could upload either automatically or manually to LOTW or QRZ.com or any other online websites. LOTW is, stands for Log of the World. It's the American Radio Relay League administered online system for electronically exchanging confirmations. That's the old modern version of a paper QSL card. And it also can be used for applying for various awards like Worked All States, DXEC, Worked All Continents. 
So if you're not familiar with logbook of the world, I believe you have to be a member of the AWRL to use it. it it's, it's wonderful once you learn how to use it. it. I myself struggled in the beginning, but it's been simplified over the years. Now, what modes will you operate? Well, single sideband is traditional voice. More code or C, abbreviated CW is no longer required to obtain your license. However, it's in recent years gaining popularity. I think just because it's challenging and it's fun. Then we have the digital modes such as FT8 and FT4 using free WSJTX software. And this permits you to work stations around the world with very low signal to noise ratio. So I could, you know what, if I'm up at one in the morning and I shouldn't be, and I get on to 20 meters, it's dead as a doornail. I won't hear a single station coming through usually on CW or sideband this time of year, but I could get on FD8 and probably work 100 stations in 20 countries in under an hour and a half. So the digital modes are a lot more fun than I thought when I first started playing with them. And we have several members that are truly experts on the digital modes. So you could turn to them for advice. Now, why do I N3US Love HF operation? I've been operating since 1963. I, I enjoy every single contact I make. I have friends worldwide of diverse and most interesting backgrounds. Some of the famous hams that I've spoken to include uh, Senator Barry Goldwater, Arthur Godfrey, there's probably a lot of members here who don't know who Arthur Godfrey was, a radio media person. Walter Cronkite, the famous CBS reporter. I spoke to King Hussein of Jordan three or four times. Father Moran, who was an American priest living in Nepal for many years. I spoken to the actor Tim Allen three or four times. I spoke to and got to know the comedian Gary Shandling quite well. All the above with the exception of Tim Allen are now what we call silent keys deceased. So again, although I bragged about working some of these famous people, I enjoy every contact, vocal, DX meaning international, rich, poor, famous, just the average Joe Blow. With COVID isolation, I was able to socialize without masking. That was a plus. I did notice in the first six months of severe isolation due to COVID, the HF bands were more active than ever despite mediocre conditions. And I, there's no doubt people were staying home. So the takeaway is in order to operate HF, for the most part, you need to upgrade to your general. So I encourage members to upgrade to general. A technician can operate only on a portion of 10 meters. Get on HF, have a lot of fun. Ask members like me, anyone in the club for advice and assistance. So now I'll say da da, did it, it, did it, da da. Hopefully, you members knew what that meant in Morse code. So any questions? We've got, got one important lesson that we've learned is don't Last talk dead on the radio if you want to stay alive. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Ed, when you put your vertical antenna up and lay out your radials, uh, I've got a vertical up, but uh, I've only got about half of my radials in all on one side. Uh, I was thinking about just firing up the transmitter and just seeing how well that might work. Uh, could I expect that antenna to perform reasonably well if you only have half the radials in? Is it, is it ground mounted? Say that again. Is, it's not roof mounted, it's ground mounted. Yeah, ground mounted. You know, I've fooled around with verticals, not as much as horizontal wire antennas. And I found the more radials I had, preferably 
spread out 360 degrees, the better performance. What is man one day? And I don't, you know, I had a vertical at my previous location and I started out with about 12 radials. And when I got up to 100 radials, which was a lot of work, to be honest, it started to perform quite well. So I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Well, but this, the this, more of the radials, the better. And there's dozens of articles online about what the optimum length of the radial should be. Okay. Well, uh, how much does the ground moisture affect this? I mean, That's right now, boy, you broke. You actually read my mind. I was debating what I was. When I lived in Colorado many years ago, I put up a vertical very quickly, and I had hardly any radials. And it worked out like you couldn't believe so well. But I discovered my house was built on the site of an old copper mine. So there was a lot of copper in the ground. So <laughs> when I first moved here, I put up an off-center fed dipole. Plus, I put up a vertical. And the vertical had very few radials. But it was in a portion, the lowest portion of my yard. And it was always wet because we used to get rain. So. You know, there's not a doubt in my mind if you have a lot of moisture in the ground, you could get by with less radials. That's why ships operating Marine Mobile get by so well. Well, the reason I haven't uh, got out and put in the rest of the radials is because the yard is too muddy. So I think I'll just fire up the rig and see what I get. Well, I just put my radials here on top of the ground. I sort of slid it the ground and they just matted down on their own. I didn't, mine were never more than a half inch below grade, just enough so my mower wouldn't tangle them up. You know, my own prejudice is if you just put up a dipole antenna, even as long as it's up 30, 40 feet, it's gonna work. Verticals work very well, but they require, you know, they work well if you have a the proper amount of radials. Ed, we've got a, a question uh, from uh, Ben. He'd like to know uh, what would be the cheapest way to get on HF without relying on finding used gear? Are there any companies making HF radios similar to how Baofeng's come in at much lower price than the big bands or is HF okay, still I'm, big players only? To be, I guess I could stop sharing, correct? Yes. All right, actually, yes. There's several Chinese and Korean companies that are making new HF rigs. Some of them only run, I think they run between five and 20 watts that cover all bands, have amazing signal processing. And Ben, I could, let's see, which Ben is it? Uh, the, 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 uh, that was uh, uh, NX4S. Okay, I could send you some information, but there's a company I can't pronounce it, X-I-E-G-U, and one of our former members- Zygu. Yes. The, the, that's one of the ways people pronounce it is Zygu. I, I think there's, e see, there's even a couple more, but and it's MFJ the same company. And MFJ was importing some rig from China or Korea, but giving it the MFJ warranty. There's definitely some brand new rigs under, you know, these are like 200 to 400 dollars. Marty Weinberg has one of these Zygus and he loves it. Now, the, the downsiders are small, but they're amazing rigs for the money. Now, another thing is the club owns an ICOM 730 that, in fact, was donated by Marty Weinberg. And it's just sitting under my operating table and any club member could borrow it for a few months. Any other questions? I've, I, I've actually got one for, uh, for, K, for K4CGY. Uh, uh, Jim, I've, I've heard you sometimes speak disparagingly about low cost transmitters. Can you, can you fill me in on sort of what the issues are uh, because I know they can sometimes cause maybe some interference with other things around, but can you give me a little more of a rundown on that? Well, it depends. If, if you're talking about how well it's working for you, it's uh, how selected the receiver is and all that. As some of them are receivers overload quite easily. Um, 
even though you can usually live with it with a, turning an attenuator on. But the problem is when you start getting in a uh, contest situation with two or three stations, uh, a lot of the cheaper ones have very high uh, radiated synthesizer noise uh, that uh, is significant up to, oh, I don't know, as, as much as uh, a couple hundred KCs away from their operating frequency. Jim, and, that's the thing is, then I would say, is that really true of the modern transceivers? Is question A back to you and two? The uh, average person doesn't work contests, to be so honest. I, I'll say, unless you're working a field day or something like that, it probably doesn't matter unless you're right next door to somebody, in right. other hand. But um, uh, the older ICOMs were very bad on synthesizer noise. And in fact, uh, you could be operating 40 meter sideband and somebody would be down on the digital frequency and just push them just push the push to talk without putting any 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 uh, data on would just completely obliterate the rest of the 40 meters i agree with you the newer, newer, the newer, newer transceivers automatic. now unfortunately and i'd have to check it out to see if it if it is bad i have looked at and been told that the i that the new icom 7300 has a lot of synthesizer noise that escapes but i don't know that that's true because i've never i've never been in a situation where there was one operating close to me but that's the main thing some of the cheaper ones have very high synthesizer uh radiation uh but you can go to um sherwood engineering and his chart is amazing. He has tested, I won't say everything, but he's tested quite a bit of the equipment out there. And you can look at all the specs, see what the synthesizer noises are, see what, uh, what how good the receivers are, how good the transmitters are, and compare them. Yeah. yeah and also, Mike KQ9P beat me to punch. Sarah, yeah. He, Sarah had a question as she lives in the third part floor apartment is she out of luck and mike if you he says he said it better than i could you are absolutely not out of luck i got my first 30 countries running less than five watts using a 20 meter dipole taped to the ceiling in my shack or you could ground you know you could ground to your water pipes oh uh, may i say one thing about grounding sure i don't think that in my feeling it's not that important. I have virtually never grounded my equipment and it's not grounded now except through the AC outlet. Even though I've just recently run a ground wire into the shack mainly so I can connect the coax to ground in the summertime when when uh, the electrical storms come through because I hate I, I'm getting tired of seeing sparks jump off of the feed line to the nearest ground. So that's the And I, also when I said that, you know, I, it was optimum. See, I tend to run high power. So if I had a shack in my attic, that ground wire would have a lot of inductance. But yes, you're right. And, and, I, it, and I run a lot of power too. And I, nothing is grounded. Nothing is grounded together. The only thing connecting them together is the coax between them or any cable. It, and it, I, it, I've had absolutely yes. no problem. Now, the National Electric Code does say your station ground, your ground rods, and your power panel rods should all be tied together. And mine are. I'm, I must have put over, I probably have about 1,500 feet of copper Yeah. Uh, for grounds. Around the tower, all the tower grounds are connected, yeah. all the towers connected, the all the ground rods around the house, the electrical ground rod, which happens to be the furthest away from hey. anything. Hey, Jim, let's get, let, let's let some of the newer members ask some questions. Uh, hold, because yep. you and I are being perfectionists. Well, the average person. Yeah, you know, what I don't want, what I, I don't want people to think is that you have to have a perfect ground before you can operate. Right. You do not have right. to ground the equipment. Right. Well, safety is a, was the motivation behind that slide. Lightning safety, yeah, mainly. Any type of safety. Until I properly grounded myself, I was stationed, I was getting RF feedback, even running 30 watts. Uh, Ed? Yes. Hey, uh, 
Dennis again, WR4I. Um, good point about putting a board underneath your power supply. I uh, unfortunately got hit by lightning twice and it burned my carpet down here in the ham shack to the tune of, well, they couldn't match it. So they wanted to it's like insurance was like $6,000 to replace the wall to wall carpeting. So I didn't even think about that. So thank you for that tip. Secondly, uh, Jim, um, some of those radios that you get from the estate sales that the money does, they, they don't care if the money goes back to the, uh, to the person that donated it. Um, maybe you could pull one aside that you think is, 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 uh, you know, better radio that, uh, folks that uh, are starting out and just hold that along with I know you have that other one from uh, Ed I forgot who you mentioned that you have the radio yes, that, uh, Marty donated yeah Marty's Marty's radio but maybe we could pull aside one of those radios uh, for for newbies that uh, I have are not no sure mind. what they want and and just hold on to it and let and look make that as a loaner uh, for the folks so uh, yeah, we have no, we have Marty's is a loaner and several people have borrowed it. By the way, I want to, I really want to answer Sarah's question. Sarah, I have a very good friend in Northern Virginia who lives in high density housing with restrictions on outside antennas and literally in his attic above his townhouse, he just has a wire stapled, a, a, a short dipole stapled and he runs about a hundred watts and he works the world on sideband CW and, and, and on the digital mode. So you don't have to have an elaborate station with a hundred foot tower to have a lot of fun. With regard to the, uh, to the grounding that you were mentioning earlier, uh, when I was in Nigeria, we were in a six story building. The antenna was up on, on top of that, probably another story high. And uh, there was no way to ground it per se, uh, given the size of that building. I would uh, simply make sure that I disconnected every piece of uh, coax from the gear. And uh, every time there was a thunderstorm, which there were quite a few in Nigeria, in Lagos, uh, I would just stick the, the coax out the window. And that was my grounding. <laughs> That's all I could do. It worked. There's yeah. several members in our club who have successfully built magnetic loop antennas. And as Sarah reminded us, they have a small footprint and they, they work out fairly well, you know, probably yeah, equivalent it, to a dipole. If I could add one thing that uh, when I first got into uh, ham radio up, up in Alaska, um, I, I found that I really enjoyed uh, not working, not contests as much, but I really enjoyed special event stations. I, I loved looking in uh, uh, the magazine every month and seeing what special event stations were coming up. Uh, I remember I used to enjoy the, the battleship, uh, that museum event they have every year uh, where the different ships are uh, fire up their shacks. But, you know, as a new ham back in the day, uh, I'm not nearly as seasoned as most of the folks on this call, but when I first became a ham in Alaska, uh, I really enjoyed uh, trying to reach out and contact uh, those special event stations. And if you're in, a new to HF or you haven't spent a lot of time um, making contacts, calling or answering CW. Special event stations can be an awful lot of fun and you can get some neat certificates from them and such. And uh, it's just a really good time and it's not a lot of pressure. You know, it isn't like, you know, you're competing against a guy that's got a, you know, 8 million foot tower antenna farm and, you know, everything glows at night because he's pushing out so much watts. That, that's not what special events are all about. And I, I just wanted to add that because I don't think anybody mentioned it, but that sure is a good time. And I can tell you the most frustrating thing though is being a general because you will find as you go up and down 
uh, the frequencies that all the good stuff is in extra land. And <laughs> and you'll do that for about three months and you'll get so frustrated that you're going to want to bet uh, that you're going to soon want to study and get that extra. But uh, I got my tech in general on the same day. They wanted me to take my extra, but I waited six months before I took that. But uh, I can tell you, uh, special events are great. So well, special events also, you, you've got parks on the air quite active. And you amazing the number of parks that are active these days. You, you could have a lot of fun with it. And I really, uh, and you know, we had a special event that our club started up in Alaska. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to reach it, but every year they have the westernmost point of the uh, United States contiguous highway system is an anchor point about 10 miles from where I lived. And the, uh, uh, the ham radio club up there has that special event. And guess what they use for an antenna? A vertical stuck right in the beach. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there is something to be said for salt water and ground plane. <laughs> That's it. Go back to Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. I had a question where about digital modes, like I had tried FL Digi and had trouble getting anywhere with it. What is the best software to use to get into digital modes? All right, I, I'll try addressing it. I believe that the everyone on the newer digital modes are using WSJT-X by Joe Taylor and several others. Joe Taylor is a Princeton, professors won all sorts of awards. So it's WSJTX. I downloaded it about two years ago. And from the time I downloaded to the time I made my first contact was under an hour. And I'm not all that savvy on the digital modes, but it's very easy to learn and to configure. There are also in, on YouTube, a lot of uh, demonstration yes. e uh, videos that you can connect into and it really gives you a lot of good um, information that way. And then most of the modern transceivers, especially the ICOMs have just require one USB cable and that connects to your laptop or whatever you're using. And it's pretty easy to configure it. I think of my two cents worth on grounding big part of it is if you have a balanced antenna. If you have a balanced antenna like a dipole, then you can get away with not much ground. But if you have an unbalanced antenna like a vertical with not many radials or just an end fend wire, then that's when you need the ground. Hey, Joe, relative to your statement about FL Digi, that's probably uh, the best piece of software that covers just about every single digital mode there is, except for the FP8, FP4, one not. But uh, it, it takes some uh, doing to get it set up correctly. So, so what's the best way to figure out how to get it set up correctly? Well, I got a question. Talk Isn't to people who use it. <laughs> okay. So Are many people operating FL Digi on HF? Say again. I thought there's very little people operating FL Digi, Digi on HF. No, that FL Digi will, will cover any uh, frequency that you want to use out there. Yeah, but in terms of actual, is there any activity? It's like PK31. I don't think there's much activity on it anymore. That's, that's the problem. It will, it will cover CW too. Sounds like a topic for another presentation. The one, the one thing with like FT8 and that sort of thing is they were just, there was just an article uh, talking about reminding the technicians that you can use FT8, but only on your allowed bands. Right. And that you had a lot of technicians that were, you know, 
doing stuff on the wrong bands. Uh, but you can get into it and you can get into it almost free if you have the right radio, uh, but you do have to stay in the technician free area. Are there any additional questions? If not, I think we could wrap this up and just do some informal breakout groups. I, I think I think we need to go back to uh, Sarah's original question about uh, her uh, living in a third floor apartment and her antenna uh, predicament and whatnot. As I understand, she is going to be testing this coming weekend for her general license. So perhaps uh, could help her out on that. Warren, perhaps you're not aware of it, but in the chat, several of us have given Sarah some comments about her antenna question. Got it, thanks. Sure. So let's see, if there's no other questions, I guess I'll wrap it up or just call well, first. Ed, Ed, first we need to get a round of applause. Good, oh. <laughs> thank you for the presentation and I will stop recording. <laughs> My presentation would have been 